Speaking of shutting most of it down, how do you propose we do that? How do we make government more efficient? How do we make it smaller? What are the different What are the different ideas of how to do that? Well, the first thing I will say is you're always taking a risk. Okay, there's there's no free lunch here, mostly at least. You're always taking a risk. One risk is that you say I want to reform it gradually. I want to have a grand master plan and get to exactly what the right end state is and then carefully cut with a chisel like a work of art to get there. I don't believe that approach works. I think that's an approach that conservatives have taken for many years. I think it hasn't gotten us very far. And the reason is if you have like an eight-headed hydra and you cut off one of the heads, it grows right back. The other risk you could take, so that's the risk of not cutting enough. The other risk you could take is the risk of cutting too much. To say that I'm going to cut so much that I'm going to take the risk of not just cutting the fat, but also cutting some muscle along the way, that I'm going to take that risk. I can't give you option C, which is to say that I'm going to cut exactly the right amount. I'm going to do it perfectly. Okay, you don't know ex ante. You don't know beforehand that that's exactly how it's going to go. So that's a meaningless claim. It's only a question of which risk you're going to take. I believe in the moment we live in right now, the second risk is the risk we have to be willing to take. And we haven't had, we haven't had a class of politician. I mean, Donald Trump in 2016 was, I think, the closest we've gotten. And I think the second term will be even, even closer to what we need. But short of that, I don't think we've really had a class of politician who has gotten very serious about cutting so much that you're also going to cut some fat, but not only some fat, but also some muscle. That's the risk we have to take. So I, what would I, the way I would do it, 75% headcount reduction across the board in the federal bureaucracy, send them home packing, shut down agencies that shouldn't exist, rescind every unconstitutional regulation that Congress never passed. In a true self-governing democracy, it should be our elected representatives that make the laws and the rules, not an unelected bureaucrats. And that is the single greatest form of economic stimulus we could have in this country, but it is also the single most effective way to restore self-governance in our country as well. And it is the blueprint for, I think, how we save this country. That's pretty gangster. 75%. Uh, there's this kind of almost meme-like video of uh, Argentinian President uh, Javier Malay. <laughs> We're on a whiteboard. He has all the, I think, 18 ministries lined up. And he's like, he's ripping like the Depart Department of Education, gone. Yeah. Or, and he's just going like this. Uh, now, the situation in Argentina is pretty dire. Mm -hmm. And and the, the situation in the United States is not, despite everybody saying, oh, the, the empire is falling. This is still, in my opinion, the greatest nation on earth. Still, the economy is doing very well. Still, there's this is the hub of culture, the hub of uh, innovation, the hub of so many amazing things. Um, do you think it's possible to do something like firing 75% of people in government when things are going relatively well? Yes. In fact, I think it's necessary and essential. I think things are, depends on depends on what your level of well really is, what you're benchmarking against. America's not built on complacency, right? We're built on the pursuit of excellence. And are we still the greatest nation on planet Earth? I believe we are. I agree with you on that. But are we great as we could possibly be or even as we have been in the past measured against our own standards of excellence? No, we're not. I think the nation is in a trajectory of decline. That doesn't mean it's the end of the empire yet. But we are a nation in decline right now. I don't think we have to be. But part of that decline is driven by the rise of this managerial class, the bureaucracy sucking the lifeblood out of the country, the sucking the lifeblood out of our innovative culture, our culture of self-governance. So is it possible? Yeah, it's, it's really possible. I mean, I'll tell you one easy way to do it. This is a little bit, I'm being a little bit glib here, but I think it's not crazy, at least as a thought experiment. Get in there on day one, say that anybody in the federal bureaucracy who is not elected, elected representatives obviously are elected by the people, but if the people who are not elected if your social security number ends in an odd number, you're out. If it ends in an even number, you're in. There's a 50% cut right there. Of those who remain, if your social security number starts in an even number, you're in. And if it starts with an odd number, you're out. Boom. That's a 75% reduction. Then literally stochastically, okay? One of the virtues of that, it's a thought experiment, not a policy prescription. But one of the virtues of that thought experiment is that 
you don't have a bunch of lawsuits you're dealing with about gender discrimination or racial discrimination or political viewpoint discrimination. Actually, the reality is you've at mass, you didn't bring the chisel, you brought a chainsaw. I guarantee you do that on day one and do number to step two on day two on day three. Not a thing will have changed for the ordinary American other than the size of their government being a lot smaller and more restrained, spending a lot less money to operate it. And most people who've run a company, especially larger companies, know this. It's 25% of the people who do 80 to 90% of the useful work. These government agencies are no different. So now imagine you could do that same thought experiment, but not just doing it at random, but do it still at large scale while having some metric of screening for those who actually had both the greatest competence as well as the greatest commitment and knowledge of the Constitution. That, I think, would immediately raise not only the civic character of the United States, now we feel, okay, the people we elect to run the government, they've got the power back, they're running the government again, as opposed to the unelected bureaucrats who wield the power today. It would also stimulate the economy. I mean, the regulatory state is like a wet blanket on the American economy. Most of it's unconstitutional. All we require is leadership with a spine to get in there and actually do what conservative presidents have maybe gestured towards and talked about, but have not really effectuated ever in modern history. And by the way, that kind of thing would attract the ultra competent to actually want to work in government. Exactly, which you're missing today. Because right now the government would swallow them up. Most competent people feel like that bureaucratic machine will swallow them whole. You clear the decks of 75% of them, real innovators can then show up. Yeah, you know, th there's kind of this cynical view of capitalism where people think that the only reason you do anything is to earn more money. But I think a lot of people would want to work in government to build something that's helpful to a huge number of people. Yeah, well, look, I think um, there's, there's opportunities for the very best to have large scale impact in all kinds of different institutions, in our universities, sure. to K through 12 education through entrepreneurship. I'm obviously very biased in that regard. I think there's a lot you're able to create that you couldn't create through government. But I do think in the moment that we live in, where our government is as broken as it is and is as responsible for the declining nature of our country, yeah, I think bringing in people who are unafraid, talented, and able to have an impact could make all of the difference. And, and I agree with you. I don't think actually most people, even most people who say they're motivated by money, I don't think we're actually motivated by money. I think most people are driven by a belief that they can do more than they're being permitted to do right now with their skill sets. See, I've never, I'll tell you that, so I've run, I've run a number of companies and one of the things that I used to ask when I was, you know, I'm not day-to-day -day involved in them anymore, but as a CEO, I would ask when I did interviews and the first company I started at Royvent, like for, Four years in, I mean, we're, you know, company was pretty big by that point. I would still intent on interviewing every candidate before they joined, screening for the culture of that person. And I can talk a lot more about things we did to build that culture. But one of the questions I would always ask them naturally just to start a conversation, it's a pretty basic question is, why did you leave your last job or why are you leaving your last job? I'll tell you what I didn't hear very often is that I wasn't paid enough. Right? And maybe they'd be shy to tell you that during an interview, but there's indirect ways to signal that. That really wasn't at all, like even a top 10 reason why people were leaving their job. I'll give you what the number one reason was, is that they felt like they were unable to do the true maximum of what their potential was in their prior role. That's the number one reason people leave their job. And, you know, I think, for, by the way, that's, I would say that as I'm saying that in a self-boastful way that we would attract these people. I think that's also true for most of the people who left the company as well, Royvent, right? And 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 it's and that was true at Royvent, it's true at other companies I've I've started. I think the number one reason people join companies and the number one people leave companies, whether they've been to join mine or to leave mine in the past, have been that they feel like they're able to do more than they're able to with their skill set than that environment permits them to actually achieve. And so I think that's what people hung for. When we think about capitalism and true free market capitalism, and we used words earlier like meritocracy, it's about building a system, whether it's in a nation or whether it's even within an organization, that allows every individual to flourish and achieve the maximum of their potential. And sometimes it just doesn't match for an organization where, let's say, the mission is here and somebody's skill sets could be really well aligned to a different mission. Then the right answer is it's not a negative thing. It's just that that person needs to leave and find their mission somewhere else.
But to bring that back to government, I think part of what's happened right now is that the rise of that bureaucracy in so many of these government agencies has actually obfuscated the mission of these agencies. I, I think if you went to most federal bureaucracies and just asked them, like, what's the mission? I'm just making one up off the top of my head right now. The Department of Health and Human Services. What is the mission of HHS in the United States of America? I doubt somebody who works there, even the person who leads it, could give you a coherent answer to that question. I, I just I just heavily doubt it. And you could fill in the blank for you know any range of other department of commerce i mean I just could just go straight down the list of each of these other ones what is the mission of this organization you can even say it for the u.s military what's the purpose of the u.s military the department of defense i can give you one i think it is to win wars and more importantly through its strength to avoid wars that's it well okay if that's the mission then you know okay it's not tinkering around and messing around in some foreign conflict where we kind of feel like it sometimes and other ones where we don't and who decides that i don't really know but Whoever the people are that decide that, we follow those orders. No, our mission is to protect the United States of America, to win wars, and to avoid wars. Boom. Those three things. What does protecting the United States of America mean? Number one, the homeland of the United States of America and the people who reside there. Okay, that's a clear mission. I mean, the Department of Health and Human Services maybe could be a reasonable mission to say that I want to make America the healthiest country on planet Earth. And we will develop the metrics and meet those metrics. And that's the goal of the Department of HHS to set policies or at least to implement policies that best achieve that goal. But you can't, and, and, and maybe that's the right statement of the mission, maybe it's not. But what, one of the things that happens is when you're governed by the committee class, it dilutes the sense of mission out of any organization, whether it's a company or a government agency or bureaucracy. And once you've done that, then you lose the ability to track the best and the brightest because in order for somebody to achieve the maximum of their potential, they have to know what it's towards. There has to be a mission in the first place. Then you're not getting the best and brightest. You get more from the committee class and that becomes a self-perpetuating downward spiral. And that is what the blob of the federal bureaucracy really looks like today. Yeah, you said something really profound at the individual scale of the individual contributor, doer, creator. What happens is you have a certain capacity to do awesome shit. And then there's barriers that come up. We have to wait a little bit. This happens, there's friction always. In, when humans together are working on something, there's friction. And so the, the goal of a great company is to minimize that friction, minimize the number of barriers. And what happens is the managerial class, the incentive is, is for, to create barriers. It's what it does. I mean, that's just by the nature of a bureaucracy. It creates sand in the gears to slow down whatever the other process was. Is there some room for that somewhere in certain contexts? Sure. It's like a defensive mechanism that's designed to reduce dynamism. But I think when you, when that becomes cancerous in its scope, it then actually kills the host itself, whether that's a school, whether that's a company, whether that's a government. And so, so the way I think about it, Lex, is there's a there's sort of a balance of distributed power. Uh, and I don't mean power in the in the Foucault sense of social power, but I mean just sort of power in the sense of the ability to effect relevant change in any organization between what you could call the founder class, the creator class, the everyday citizen, the stakeholder class, and then the managerial class. And, and there's a role for all three of them, right? You could have the constituents of an organization, say in a constitutional republic, that's the citizen. You could have the, the equivalent of the creator class, the people who create things in that, in that polity. And then you have the bureaucratic class that's designed to administer and serve as a liaison between the two. I'm not denying that there's some role somewhere for people who are in that managerial class. But right now, in this moment in American history, and I think it's been more or less true for the last century, but it's grown, starting with Woodrow Wilson's advent of the modern administrative state, metastasizing through FDR's New Deal and what was required to administer it, blown over and, and metastasizing further through LBJ's great society and and everything that's happened since, even aided and abetted by Republican presidents along the way, like Richard Nixon, has created a United States of America where that committee class, both in and outside the government in our culture, wields far too much influence and power relative to the everyday citizen stakeholder and to the creators who are in many ways constrained, hamstrung, shackled, in a straitjacket from achieving the maximum of their own potential contributions. And, um, you know, I, I certainly feel that myself. I, you know, I probably identify as being a member of that creator class most closely. It's just what I've done. I create things. And I think we live in an environment in the United States of America where we're still probably the best country on earth. 
where that creator has that shot. So that's the positive side of it. But one where we are far more constrictive to the creator class than we have been when we've been at our best. And that's what I want to see change. Can you sort of steel man the perspective of somebody that looks at a particular department, Department of Education, as, and are saying that the amount of pain that would be caused by closing it and firing 75% of people will be too much? Yeah. So I go back to this question of mission, right? A lot of people who make arguments for the Department of Education aren't aware why the Department of Education was created in the first place, actually. So that might be a useful place to start, is that this thing was created. It had a purpose, presumably. What was that purpose? Might be at least a relevant question to ask before we decide what are we doing with it or not. What was the purpose of this thing that we created? It's not a it, it to me seems like a highly relevant question, yet in this discussion about government reform, it's interesting how eager people are to skip over that question and just to talk about, okay, but we got the status quo and it's just going to be disruptive versus asking the question of, okay, this institution was created. It had an original purpose. Is that purpose still relevant? Is this organization at all fulfilling that purpose today? To me, those are some relevant questions to ask. So let's talk about that for the Department of Education. Its purpose was relevant at that time, which was to make sure that localities and particularly states we're not siphoning dollars, taxpayer dollars, away from predominantly black school districts to predominantly white ones. And that was not a theoretical concern at the time. It was happening, or there was at least some evidence that that was happening in certain states in the South. And so you may say you don't like the federal solution. You may say you like the federal solution, but like it or not, that was the original purpose of the U.S. Department of Education to make sure that from a federal perspective, states were not systematically disadvantaging black school districts over predominantly white ones. However noble and relevant that purpose may have been six decades ago, it's not a relevant purpose today. There's no evidence today of states intentionally mapping out which are the black versus white school districts and siphoning money in one direction versus another. To the contrary, one of the things we've learned is that the school districts in the inner city, many of which are predominantly black, actually spend more money per student than other school districts for a worse result as measured by test scores and other performance on a per student basis, suggesting that there are other factors than the dollar expenditures per school determining student success, and actually suggesting that even the overfunding of some of those already poorly run schools rewards them for their actual bureaucratic failures. So against that backdrop, the Department of Education has instead extrapolated that original purpose of what was a racial equality purpose to instead implement a different vision of racial equity through the ideologies that they demand in the content of the curricula that these public schools actually teach. So Department of Education funding, so federal funding accounts for about, you know, I'm giving you round numbers here, but around 10% of the funding of most public schools across the country. But that comes with strings attached. So in today's Department of Education, this didn't happen back in 1970, but it's happening today. Ironically, it's funny how these things change with the bureaucracies that fail. They blow oak smoke to cover up for their own failures. What happens with today's Department of Education? They effectively say you don't get that funding unless you adopt certain goals deemed at achieving racial or gender equity goals. And in fact, they also intervene in the curriculum where there's evidence of schools in the Midwest or in the Great Plains that have been denied funding because Department of Education funding, so long as they have certain subjects like archery. There was one instance of a school that had archery in its curriculum. I, I find that to be pretty interesting, actually. I think that I think you have different kinds of physical education. This is one that combines mental focus with physical aptitude. But hey, maybe I'm biased. Doesn't matter whether you like archery or not. I don't think it's the federal government's job to withhold funding from a school because they include something in their curriculum that the federal government deems inappropriate, where that locality found that to be a relevant locus of education. So what you see then is an abandonment of the original purpose that's long past. You don't have this problem that the Department of Education was originally formed to solve of siphoning money from black school districts to white school districts and laundering that effectively in public funds. That doesn't exist anymore. So they find new purposes instead, creating a lot more damage along the way. So you asked me to steel man it, and could I say something constructive rather than just you know pounding down on the other side? One way to think about this is, for a lot of these agencies, were many of them formed with a positive intention at the outset? Yes, 
where that positive intention existed, I'm still a skeptic of creating bureaucracies, but if you're going to create one, at least make it, what should we call it? Uh, <laughs> a task force. Make it a task force. A task force versus an agency means after it's done, you celebrate, you've done your work, pat yourself on the back, and then move on, rather than creating a standing bureaucracy, which actually finds things to do after it has already solved or addressed the first reason it was born in the first place. And I think we don't have enough of that in our culture. Right? I mean, even if you have a company that's generated tons of cash flow and it solved a problem, let's say it's a let's say it's a biopharmaceutical company that developed a cure to some disease. And the only thing people knew at that company was how to develop a cure to that disease. And they generated a boatload of cash from doing it. At a certain point, you could just give it to your shareholders and close up shop. And that's actually a beautiful thing to do. You don't see that happen enough in the American consciousness and the American culture of when an institution has achieved its purpose, celebrate it and then move on. And I think that that culture in our government would result in a vastly restrained scope of government Rather than today, it's a one-way ratchet. Once you cause it to come into existence, you cause new things to come into existence, but the old one that came into existence continues to persist and exist as well. And that's where you get this metastasis over the last century. So what kind of things do you think government should do that the private sector, the forces of capitalism would create drastic inequalities or create the kind of pain we don't want to have in government? So if the question is, what should government do that the private sector cannot? I'll give you one. Protect our border. I mean, capitalism, it's never going to be the job of capitalists or never going to be the capability or inclination of capitalists to preserve a national border. And I think a nation, it's literally, uh, I think one of the chapters of this book, okay, a nation without borders is not a nation. It's almost a tautology. An open border is not a border. Capitalism is not going to solve that. What's going to solve that is a nation. Part of the job of the federal government is to protect the homeland of its nation, in this case, the United States of America. That's an example of a proper function of the federal government to provide physical security to its citizens. Another proper role of that federal government is to look after, or, or in this case, it could be state government, to make sure that private parties cannot externalize their costs onto somebody else without their consent. It's a fancy way economists would use to describe it. What does that mean? It means if you go dump your chemicals in somebody else's river, then you're liable for that. It's not that, okay, I'm a capitalist, and so I want to create things, and I'm going to do hell or high water, whether or not that harms people around me. The job of a proper government is to make sure that you protect the rights of those who may be harmed by those who are pursuing their own rights through a system of capitalism. In seeking prosperity, you're free to do it. But if you're hurting somebody else without their consent in the process, the government is there to enforce what is really just a different form of enforcing a private property right. So I would say that those are two central functions of government is to preserve national boundaries and the national security of a homeland. And number two is to protect and preserve private property rights and the enforcement of those private property rights. And I think at that point, you've described about 80 to 90% of the proper role of a government. What about infrastructure? Look, I think that most infrastructure can be dealt with through the private sector. I mean, you can get into specifics. You could have infrastructure that's specific to national security. No, I do think that military industrial base is essential to provide national security. That's a form of infrastructure. I don't think you could rely exclusively on the private sector to provide the optimal level of that protection to a nation. But, you know, interstate highways, you know, I think you could think about whether or not that's a common good that everybody benefits from, but nobody has the incentive to create. I think you could make an argument for the existence of, of interstate highways. I think you could also make powerful arguments for the fact that actually you could have enough private sector co-ops that could cause that to come into existence as well. But, you know, I'm not going to be, I'm not, I'm not uh, dogmatic about this, but broadly speaking, 80 to 90% of the goal of the federal government, I'm not going to say 100, 80 to 90% of the goal of the existence of a federal government should be to, of government period, should be to protect national boundaries and provide security for the people who live there and to protect the private property rights of the people who reside there. If we restore that, I think we're well on our way to a revival of what our founding fathers envisioned. And I think many of them would give you the same answer that I just did. So if we get government out of education, would you be also for reducing this as a government in the states for educate for something like education? I think here, if it goes closer to municipalities and to states, I'm fine with that being a locus for people determining as, for example, let's just say school districts are taxed at the local level. 
for that to be a matter for municipalities and townships to actually decide democratically how they actually want that governed, whether it's balanced between a public school district versus making that same money available to families in the form of vouchers or other forms of, of ability to educational savings accounts or whichever mechanism it is to opt out of that. If that's done locally, I'll have views on that that tend to go further in the direction of true educational choice and diversity of choice the implementation of charter schools, the granting of state charters, or even lowering the barriers to granting one. I favor those kinds of policies. But if we've gotten the federal government out of it, that's achieved 75% of what I think we need to achieve, that I'm focused on solving other problems and leave that to the states and municipalities to to cover from there.